Eugene Johnson, uh, 123.32, born, my birthday is on the 23rd of January. Yeah, Th 1932. Where yeah. were you born? Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania. Could you spell the place where you were born? P-H-I-L-I. P-H? P-H-I-L-I-P-S-B-U-R-G. Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Tell me about your family when you were growing up, parents and your siblings. Um, I come from a big family. My father was a coal miner. I was the oldest in the family. Mm -hmm. And we lived out in the country, raised our own food. Mm -hmm. He was a coal miner. Mm -hmm. How many siblings do you have? I did have six. And you are the eldest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the school you went through. I went to grade school through the eighth grade. And I went uh, three years, almost three years in high school. Mm -hmm. I quit high school my junior year. Mm -hmm. And you enlisted? I went in the Army in July of 48. July? 48. Mm -hmm. I was 16. July, July 16th? No, I was 16 years old. Oh, how did you get into the Army? Very easy back then, right after the war. No problem at all. No, you are supposed to be 18, right? To sign, to have nobody sign for you, right. 17, your parents could sign. And you were 16? Yeah. And nobody was able to sign it for you? No. How did you get it in? I just had a baptismal record and changed the date. And you changed the date of your birthday? Of my year. You changed your year? Mm, so from you 1932 to 1930. So you cheated? So I didn't cheat. I just went in the Army. I wanted to go in the Army. But you cheated your, the year that you were born. I had to. I had to leave <laughs> home. My life at home, I had to leave town. And the Army was a good way. Wow. So, where did you get the basic military t training? I went to Fort Dix, New Jersey. Fort Dixon, New Jersey, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And what kind of training did you receive? Infantry training. Infantry. And that's your specialty? Rifleman? No. No. And I went to leadership school mm -hmm. in 1948. Then in November, I went to Japan. So, 1948, November, you went to Japan. What did you do in Japan? I was, for a short time, I was in Koizumi, it was I was in the artillery section. I was in the artillery. Uh huh. A cannoneer. Mm hmm. And when the Seventh Division came back from Korea in '49, uh huh. I was transferred from First Cavalry Division to the Seventh Division mm -hmm. in Jinmachi, Japan. Uh huh. Where I was a company clerk then. Did you know anything about Asia, Japan, Korea, no. China, before you come to those? No, it was just countries. I didn't. I mean, Japan, the war, you know, I understood the war, Japan. How was life in Japan? It was good in Japan. I, I enjoyed it there. It was no problems. Mm hmm And then how did you come to know about the breakout of the Korean War? Well, I was in later Japan in 49. I went to cook and baker school down at Itajima. Cook and bake school? Right. I was a cook then. Oh. I went in the mess hall, food service. Huh. And in 1950, about... April, I was getting ready to come home. Ah. And then the 
things got hot and cold in, and I didn't make it. Wow. And we went, we went to Korea in September. I landed at Incheon. You remember the date? Seventh, well, September 1950. Uh, we Did land you participate in the Incheon landing? Right. So must be September 15th, 16th? Yeah, I think my group got in there about the 16th or 17th, one right after the, the Incheon invasion. Ah. Were you afraid, excited? What, what were you thinking at the time? I'm just being a soldier. I was young and I went along with it. It was. You know, I wasn't married, I left home, I, I was a soldier. What did you see in Incheon when you landed? Uh, we went up to Wewon. I was in field artillery, and the infantry already went, was going up, took Suwon and was going up to Seoul, and we were just had a few fire missions, and, and then things settled down. We took Seoul. And Did you fire toward the soul? Right. Uh huh. The guns fired toward soul, and then uh, probably first part of October, we got a convoy and we went back. We was going to Pusan, our our division. Huh. So, you know, going to be home for Christmas, <laughs> and then things broke out. I, Pyongyang and what have you, and Sigmund and me sent the poop up there, and we didn't go home. We went and uh, invaded and made the inv uh, beachhead up at once on up in North Korea. Tell me about uh, after what happened after you landed in Wonsan. You, you we, supported the Marine and inf Infantry no. toward the Changjin Reservoir, or what did you do? Yeah, well, we landed, we landed in Wonsan, and then we went up to the, almost the Yellow River, to the Seventh Division. Straight north or Straight west? Straight north. Straight north. Uh huh. Then we had Thanksgiving dinner there, and our Colonel, we got a close station march order to go to the Mar to the Chosen Reservoir to relieve the Marines east of the Chosen. Then, if you. You went up to Yalu River and yeah. then came down we to... We had to come. We couldn't cross the mountain. We, we was going to the reservoir. We couldn't get over that mountain. It was, the snow was... Right, right. And we come all the way back to Ham Hung and then up to the reservoir. Okay. And the Marines pulled out east that... We got up there 27th, I think, in November. The Marines pulled out and went... W West of the Chosen, and our outfit, 31st Infantry, and what, and the 57th Field Artillery Battalion, we were east of the Chosen. And the Chinese, we pulled a position that night at about five o'clock. 31st Infantry, and what is your? Artillery? We supported the 31st, 57th Field Artillery Battalion. 57th. F A B N, right. Field Artillery Division. Battalion. Battalion. Yep. We supported the 31st. Ah. So you were east of Changjin Reservoir. Right. Yeah. Up at the inlet, we called it. Uh -huh. That's where my, uh, my, my battery was. How successful were you at the time? Were you able to? No. No. We, we got hit two th about 2.30 that morning. The Chinese came in on the 27th. Uh -huh. And... We, they killed a lot of our battery because we were behind the guns. And around, we had about, it was in the mid afternoon, we moved our headquarters up the inlet to where the infantry came back and we set up there yeah. on the reservoir. And we stayed there till the First day of first day of December, I was wounded twice, both hands and feet frozen, 
And on December the 1st, our, well, our battalion commander was hit 26 times. He got evacuated. And our colonel, just made colonel, Colonel Tolley, called some of the NCOs together and said, I got two choices, surrender or try to make a break for it. And the NCOs and that said, no, we're not surrendering. We're going to make a break. So they loaded all the us wounded and that on trucks, what couldn't walk. And we gave up our weapons and we started out of there. And the truck, well, it was about 3.30 in the afternoon, 4 o'clock. They had blowed a bridge up, Chinese, and we were trying to get around it. And darkness fell and that was it. We, we never got to the first roadblock. They were wounded and on wounded truck, killed a lot of guys. That's the December 1st. Right. And my truck was lucky. They didn't shoot us. Why? I don't And then we, they marched us up and down the mountains for about two days and two nights. And about the third day or fourth day, one of there, we went into what we called Death Valley. It was a valley near the reservoir. Mm. And they, some guys that wasn't wounded and that, they moved them on out, went up to the camps, up to Chung Song, and uh, my buddies told me, but I didn't get out of Death Valley till the end of March, 51. And it took us 20-some days to get to Camp 5 and Puck Tong. From Death Valley? Yeah. Mm. We call it Death Valley. It's a valley close to the reservoir. And you said 27 days to walk into... Roughly, yes. It was in that walk, a ride a little bit and to Camp 5 and Puck Tong. What were you thinking? At the time you were marching toward Camp 5, Trying to survive. <laughs> First 44 days, we got three potatoes a day in Death Valley. And they cooked that in with the mule food. They had mules there. And then we got some cracked corn and some millet and goleon. How do they Chinese treat you guys? They... In the Death Valley, they were moving so much. They had us in houses. They just moved the Koreans out of the houses and moved us in. You know, they they just took the street and they just moved them out. Mm -hmm. I don't know where they went. They're, they're probably the friends or whatever. And, but they, the tr treatment was, we was interrogated in that. Mm -hmm. And... They were, they were more or less wanting to know how many men we had up there and what have you, and wanting to know our what guns we had. And I was interrogated, and I didn't like that too well. I told them I was a cook. I <laughs> served the food, and of course I lost about. 60 pounds there in the valley. Uh, down to about 100, 110 pounds, somewhere around there. And then we got to Camp 5. It was a, yeah, it was a quite a death toll up there. I wasn't up there when it first started, but I guess the first few months at Camp 5 was really bad. Uh. And we still had, when I got there for the next few months, was the death toll was up but not, not like it was. And then they, the Chinese, they wanted to teach us how great communism was. And Indoctrination? Yeah, Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, Chow and Lai, Kim Il-sung, you know. He, well, I was young, and that's, I think that's helped me get out of there. Because I, you know, I had a rough life at home. Hmm. And, you know, I said, ain't no Chinaman gonna and 
We had very few Korean, North Koreans. I mean, there was no, we had a few soldiers there in mm -hmm. Death Valley, but not, it was all Chinese. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the camps were all Chinese. And they tried to indoctrinate us. And yeah. How did you deal with that kind of indoctrination? I, I think I'd done well because mm -hmm. I was young. I, you know, uh, you're trying to tell me something that I know and Sometime I got in trouble with that, uh -huh. you know, and uh, Chinese. Then they separated us in the camp five in, in Pak Tong by age, more or less, you know. Oh. These young guys, these middle guys, these are the old guys. Mm -hmm. And the old guys, they figured they, you know, they, they're not going to teach them nothing. And they tried to, and you could, our interpreter was educated at UCLA. Chinese? Yeah. <laughs> That's what he told. Don't bullshit me. Yeah. I was educated at UCLA. And we had a Chinese colonel was nasty. Mm -hmm. And the ringleader of the 21 that stayed back, you know, there was 21 men. Yeah. Was my squad leader in there. What do you mean 21 men who joined the China? Yeah. But the one, Sergeant Corden, we were in the same squad in Camp Fire. Uh, he was my squad leader. Did he really believe in socialism? Oh, yeah. You think? Oh, yeah, because I, yeah, him and I didn't get in. He turned me into the Chinese. Hmm. We stole some sweet potatoes from the Chinese, and we was unloading the barge, and he turned us in. Were there tension among those supported Chinese or and those who refused to collaborate? Oh, was yeah, it, it, it was... It was, uh, you know, them guys, like Corden. I don't know the other. I didn't know them all, but I know Corden well. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he, I don't know what made him believe that, right. that socialism, communism was great. When, you know, I'd say we had to discuss what the colonel said, you know. And right. I'd ask a question, you know. He would always agree with, mm -hmm. and I said, example, why, if communism's so great, why is the colonel all sharp and the interpreter? And I, in fact, I asked the interpreter one day and got in trouble. We had a, there was a, we called him a dog robber. Mm -hmm. He was a lack, you know, he carried hot water up to the colonel and, you know, and his uniform looked like it was 40 years old. He smelled, mm -hmm. there was holes in it, and they got real sharp uniforms. And I asked him one day, I said, why is Wu, <laughs> you know, look like a bum, and his clothes is stinks and ragged and dirty, and and you all sharped up, clean, and you say everybody's equal. <laughs> and if something don't add up, you shut up. You remember, you're a prisoner of war. If you challenged them, you'd get along a little bit, and then you're a prisoner of war. I had a Chinese colonel lay a pistol up when I asked a few questions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you you could go so far and you had to back off. You know, I had to know when to when lighten to back up. Off, yeah. Yeah. And did you hope, did you have a hope that you could get out of there? I did. I swore I would get out of it. We was coming home. But many actually gave up their life, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. We had got, well, a lot of the guys died, gave up because of, of the situation. They were wounded, they're frozen, hands, and, and no medical, and living in filth, rice. And, you know, it, now me and my buddy took care of one another. Mm -hmm. I have a picture of me in the camp. What do you mean? You took the picture in the camp? I didn't take it. I have a picture of me. Okay. And Camp 5. Who took this picture? Frank Knoll. Oh, the AP guy? AP guy. Where are you in this? In the well, left? You, you, yeah, that's me in the left. I was a young man. I got captured. I was 18. And it was in Pyeokdong? Yeah, that's in Pyeokdong. That was taken around uh, the middle of 52, before they moved the sergeants to Camp 4. 
in the middle of middles, my buddy was the chief of section in the howitzer, and the other, the one on the other was, was in second division, and he was, he was an Indian descent. Oh, N-O-L-A-N, I believe. N-O-L-A-N. Nolan, Frank Nolan. And he took them pictures. And before we moved to Camp 4, he came and, well, it was around 1st of September. Well, see, the Chinese called him to headquarters and gave him a, right. a photo, a camera. How did you get this picture from well, him? Well, he come around before they moved the sergeants to Camp 4. Right. He had a basket full of pictures. He developed that film well, there? the Chinese did. Chinese did, and they gave it to you? Well, they, yeah, no, they, they had it, he had them. And I seen them pictures, and I said to Frank, I want them. I said, I want it. I want them. No, no, no. He said the Chinese counted them. They, so I told my buddy in that picture, you keep him busy. I'm going to get them pictures, and I did. I, so this is the picture actually you got in Pyeongdong, 1952. Right. That my wife put them on there. That, that everybody said, "How'd you get pictures?" <laughs> well, that was that's how I got it. What was the most difficult thing in the camp to you? Well, number one, the food was. You know with the way they treated it. The, the last year was pretty good on food. They brought in different stuff, made some stuff buns, and we got a hog that we could kill. And, mm -hmm. But the, the the biggest thing to me, the way they said how great communism, and that's the only thing was, and how they they said everybody's equal, but you could see it. It's not equal you now. You, like I said, the colonel, you know, and everybody, and their theory. We had a we had a platoon leader, Chinese, and we called him Scarface. And he walked around and humped over. Well, we found he couldn't speak, not too good English, but he told us he was in World War Two, and he was all scarred up. Napalm hit him. And he stuck around us, and the Chinese shipped him off. One day we stole some chickens from the headquarters, and I'm cooking them on a hot little, just boiling them. And my buddy said, the one in that picture, he said, we got to have a password. I said, well, cigarette. And we always shared what cigarettes we bummed. So here come Chinaman and my buddy Hard. Johnny, cigarette. And I'm watching out the other one. I don't have any. I'm out. <laughs> and Johnny, cigarette. And I said, I, Hard, Carson, I don't have any. I told you. And he said, Johnny, look at the door. And I turned around and looked, and I seen a Chinese uniform. Mm -hmm. And... I was, and here was Scarface, and he just looked, stuck his head in and said, boo -ha. and I, he just walked away. So were you able to eat chicken? Oh, yeah, we did. We, we cooked. We just boiled it, and we ate it. So Chinese but knew, but they, he just. That platoon leader, that's all. And it wasn't long he was gone. He didn't stick around. They, they shipped him probably to the front line. So he was a nice guy. He was a nice, he was, he would always say, Miguel number one. Oh, really? It, yeah, he, he was an older. That's probably why he didn't, he, late, late, and they got rid of him. And the Chinese, you know, you could, one day a Chinaman, I was headquarters, and he said, what do you do when you go back to America? I said, I'm going to buy the biggest Cadillac in the United States. You have, still have the imperialist capitalist mind. You remember, you're a prisoner of war. And they wanted to say, you know, that they, they aid the corporations and, you know, their indoctrination to me. Well, 
I was young enough. How are you telling me this is great when I lived there, you know? And and Corden, the Sergeant Corden, he uh, he yacked their stuff. I came back. I was I had stayed in the army, and I was going overseas to Germany in 1960, Germany. And I picked the newspaper up before I got in the boat. Ex prisoner of war coming back from he came back to the United States ten years and he was suing the government for his back pay all them years. So I went to the JAG office and I was a sergeant first class. I was I said, I'm gonna press charges for what he did to me in the camp. Well then that Washington twitched back to the JAG officer and we couldn't do nothing. He wasn't going to get paid because the Army had dishonorably discharged all them 21, no future pay and allowance, do or become due. Mm -hmm. So I said, eh, what helped me through there was being young, I, I swear, because a lot of us younger guys, you know, we, and my wounds wasn't life-threatening. I got in the knee and the shoulder and but my hands and frozen feet, we worked with them every day, and, you know, I survived. And what made you get through that ordeal? Our country, our, our, our living in the United States, I mean, the way we, what we have, our freedoms, and they didn't have no freedoms as far as I was concerned. And they... They tried to preach how great everybody was, but they still had their elite, more or less. And I had a lot of stories in there that we, you know, would bank on and carry on. And I, when I went to Vietnam, I met some of the finest soldiers in the world, mm. the White Horse Division. Peng Ma, Korean. Korean. Yeah. I know the sergeant major. I was I was in the front line in Korea and I got transferred back to Cameron Bay and I run an NCO club. And I met the sergeant major of the White Horse Division and a few of the NCO. I would spend some time with them. Great number one soldiers. <laughs> Thank you. And Have you been back to Korea? No, I never went back. Why not? I it, I just didn't turn me on. I, you know, I, I could have made it, but I don't, I can't give you a good reason. And not that I don't, and I think, I think a lot of the Korean, especially like I told you, I had a surgeon who was South Korean. Don't you want to see how drastically the Korea has been transformed from shattered, devastated? That book. The yeah. first two pages I've showed people. Right. What is Korea to you? After all those years, you went through POW. What? I feel this way. We went over, and it was the United Nations. We saved that country. We gave the sacrifice. But I do know what I've been talking to some people. In fact, there was four Koreans at my house, I told you, and they wanted to make them dis to show the people what we did, why there is a South Korea today. And it's the same in our country. The young, they just don't understand. Even our, our people today, our young, they don't know World War II. They don't know Korea. They don't teach it no more. They don't know that now. And, and they, them guys told me, the interpreters, that the trouble with the young Korean, some of them, you know, America go home and and they want to show them what we did mm -hmm. because there is a South Korea today. Right. Yep. When were you released? 31st day of August, 53. From camp or did you cross the Panmunjom? We come to Panmunjom from camp four and we won. And August 31st, did yeah, you cross I, the Panmunjom? Right. I come across Freedom Building, big 31st. What did you do first? Got a cup of coffee. <laughs> ah. 
Some, Colonel. some say it's a vanilla ice cream that they Well, drink. I could have had that choice, but I wanted a cup of a bowl of coffee. I'm a, I was a cook, and I drank my coffee out of a bowl, and I wanted a bowl of coffee. Huh. A colonel, he said, what? Everybody wants ice cream. I said, I'll get my ice cream. I want some coffee. <laughs> so one Christmas, the Chinese gave our cook, we had 250 guys in our company. Uh-huh. And gave us about three tablespoons of coffee for the company. Said really? you, for your Christmas. Well, what are you uh, going to do with three tablespoons? <laughs> but yeah, that was. And I flew back. I had to go to the hospital. I flew back. I was at Valley Forge Army Hospital for up uh, right after Thanksgiving of fifty. 53, went home, got a job out in Cleveland, didn't like the first day, came back and re-enlisted in the Army. Thank you very much. You bet.